Brandon, that was great. Yeah, wasn't that good? Yeah. <clears throat> Please sing more, okay? Yeah, we can, we can take more of that. Well, it's been a week of transition for many of you. Uh, this past week, the kids came back from camp, and I think they all came back, didn't they? Did they all come back? Make, all made it back, and all the adults came back as well. And here in Huntington County, the, the kids went back to school this past Friday. <laughs> now, Wells County, you guys go back when? Tuesday. Okay, so is it the kids here need more schooling in Huntington County than they do in Wells? I, I, I don't know. But, yeah, okay, I, I didn't know, but, you know, adults, isn't life better now we don't have to go back to school? Yeah, isn't it better? You just kind of laugh, and we're glad for that. Personally speaking, uh, my oldest son and two dogs arrived on, on Wednesday, and then <clears throat> my wife arrived Friday. Yeah, she's, she really is here now, and some people are going, what does she look like? We've never seen her before. And so I'm going to have her stand up in the back. Go ahead. She's clear in the back. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's her. So, and uh, it's, it's good. It's good. It's exciting. Really, it is. The, um, the moving truck came in yesterday. It was there for like the most of the day. And so... They all unloaded, so now there's like boxes to the ceiling. We have to make pathways to go from one room to the next. And, you know, in the next two weeks, two months, two years, you know, we got that taken care of. But we're not in a hurry because, like, we, we finally got stuff settled, and it just, it's just so, so huge. And a year and a half is, is a long time. It's the longest I've really ever been by myself. And so done with that, right? Done with that, yeah. Okay, I don't know if you've been paying any attention attention to the political landscape, but if you haven't, let me bring you up to date. There are two candidates. They both were given the, the nod by their respective parties. One last name is Trump. The other last name is Clinton. Now, I don't know of any person, maybe, maybe there's someone here, I don't know of anyone who's really gung-ho excited about either of them. And what I hear is this. Well... So-and-so is the lesser of two evils. Have you heard that? Lesser of two evils. How can you get excited about voting on any level of evil? I'm, I'm like, here's my strategy now. I've changed. And this is, this is, this, this is not, this does not represent union church. This is just me. And that is, I've decided to, I will vote on the person with the best vice presidential candidate. Track me because I, it seems to me that both vice presidential candidates would be better than the presidential candidates. And if you vote for the one that hope and you vote for that party and they get in, here's my thought: maybe the presidential candidate won't be in office long. And I'm not I'm not thinking bad stuff. Okay, I don't have my fingers crossed because I could be in trouble uh, even saying that. But maybe they'll get an office, and after a couple of days, they like, you know what? This is not what I thought it would be, and I think I'll go open a fast food franchise. <laughs> or they'll think, hmm, wow, uh, I think I'm going to dedicate the next four of my life, four years of my life, training full time for the 2020 Olympics. You know, some, something like that. They'll just quit and go do something else, and then the vice presidential person will become the president. And maybe it would be better that way. Here again, I don't know if that's going to work or not. The issue for me, and I don't know about you or not, the issue always, always, and primarily comes down to character. And isn't that, isn't that the thing that, and, and maybe they have experience, and maybe they have accomplishments, but I'm always looking first and foremost for character. And when I can't see, and it seems like that, that character isn't there, and you don't have to look very far, do you? And you see in some character glitches on, on both par, in, in both individuals, it's hard for me to want to put someone in that kind of position apart from character. It's a hard for me to what put, to want to put anyone in any position of responsibility apart from character. Here's what happens. Normally we, we promote someone, someone or we applaud someone because of their talent, because of their achievements. 
uh, because of their abilities. And we go, look at that. We know I couldn't do that. Look at that. Where would we be without that? Because they can do something. But when there's a deficit of character, just you wait. And we should never be surprised when someone is elected, voted, voted in, or are given promotions because of certain character skills or certain intelligent things. In prison, what do we find out? There's a financial issue. There is some sort of a sexual issue. There, there's a substance abuse issue. Because these things will come to the top over time. I don't care how talented or how intelligent you are. And unfortunately, character and integrity is rather abnormal these days. For the kids that just came back or the kids that just went back to school, you know, we're glad if you can be on the team. We're glad if you can earn scholarships. We're glad if you're intelligent. We're glad if you have great social skills. We're glad if everyone... We're glad. But can I tell you something more important than that stuff? It's called character. It's called integrity. I've, I've been... I, every four years, I just get sucked into the vortex of the Olympics. And I, I just love watching the Olympics. I couldn't do any of that stuff. Never would be able to. Love the talent. Love the dedication. They come away and maybe get a gold medal or a number of gold medals and and good for you. But you can get a gold medal and not have character. And not have integrity. And if you have medals and money and things and you don't have integrity and character, you don't have anything. But if you have integrity and character and you don't have money and you don't have a lot of things and your name's not in the paper and people aren't clapping when they see you, but you have, you have those things, you have everything. So this morning, over the next few weeks, we're going to look at someone, we call it not, not your average Joe. Because to have integrity, to always tell the truth, To be able to live with yourself. Knowing you're not cutting corners. You're not taking the easy way. You're not coming up with, well, it's my turn and I deserve it and life's been mean to me. To live like that is is not average. And so this this person, by the way, of Joe, or he may better know him as, as Joseph, not the mother or the father of Jesus. I get messed up. But the, the, the man back in the book of Genesis, and that's what we find. And don't think, well, that was him back then. It was easier to have integrity in those days. No, it wasn't. It wasn't any easier. It's never easy in any time, in any culture. So starting, I go today and for the next several weeks, looking to the life of not your average Joe. So we're going to start in in Genesis chapter 37, second verse, and says, Now Joseph, when 17 years of of age, so he's he's relatively young, was pastoring, not pastoring, pastoring the flock with his brothers who, who were older than him. He had 10 brothers that were older and, and one that was younger. Actually, the, 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 the 10 were his half brothers. While he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. So that, that's what he's up to. He, I guess he has a, a younger uh, brother by the name of Benjamin, who is his full brother. But he's been given this job by his, by his father to look after and to give oversight of his older brothers. Now, you can almost immediately think, I don't think that's a good idea. If you, if you don't, if you were raised in a family where you're the younger one or the youngest one, and you were given responsibility to oversee your older siblings, it's probably not going to go too well. Or if you're an older one and, and for some reason your younger brother tried to tell you said tried to tell you what to do and thought that they could and should, it's probably not going to go well. Uh, but that's what he was given. That's what he was supposed to do. And and this is what happened next. See, he brought back a bad report 
about his brothers to his father. He was telling on him, but he was supposed to do that. You can almost see it already. I go, this is not going to go well. We're only a couple verses in and go, uh, I can just read the writing already. And there's going to be some upset here. There's going to be some things happening that's going to be uh, quite painful. And that's exactly right. It's not Joseph's fault at this point. But, but and here's to make matters even worse. I mean, take a look at this family. Now, Israel was Jacob. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons. Because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. Oh, my. Joseph was given favoritism. If you look back in, in the life of Israel, his dad, who was Jacob, you find out that he was his mother's favorite, and his brother was his father's favorite. If you look at the life of, of, of Israel, who, who was Jacob, you find that he, he tricked, he deceived his brother to get his brother's birthright because he was the younger one and then went and lied to his father. And then his mother said, oh, get out of here because your brother is going to take your life. So in Israel's family, there's all kind of dysfunction. And what he has done, he has brought his dysfunction, his dysfunction into his present family. Now that happens sometimes. Uh, what happened in his family origin now, he is, he is, recreated in his own family. Let me guess, somewhere as you were growing up, your mom and your dad did something, maybe they did it more than once, and you made a pact with yourself, and you told yourself this, when I grow up, when I become a mom or dad, I am never going to do that. Didn't you? That is out. That is not right. That's not unloving. That's ungodly. I will never subject my kids to what happened to me. I go, I think we all did that. I don't care who your parents were. There are no perfect parents. In fact, you say, well, I had a good dad or I had a bad dad. You know what? My dad had good things about him and he had bad things about him. My mom, same way. She had good things and bad things. Guess about when it comes to me. It's not that I'm a good dad, bad dad. I have some good parenting things. I have some poor parenting things. So just to say good and bad, that's too wide of a category. In some areas, he excelled. In some areas, he just dropped the ball. So you grow up and you decide, I am never going to. Maybe the pain was so great. You said, I am never going to put my kids in a place where they have to suffer anything. I am going to protect them. I am going to control them. I'm going to make sure their childhood, their upbringing is as pain-free as possible. Now, if you did that, what happened? What happened to your kids? You tried to protect them from everything because pain is always a bad thing. So you thought, well, maybe they grew up so incredibly spoiled. Or maybe they never figured out that there are consequences to my decisions. Because you always ran interference. Whenever they made a stupid decision, and everyone makes stupid decisions at times, sometimes we still make stupid decisions, you got in the way so they didn't have to suffer the pain of the consequences for their stupidity. And so they all, you know what? They're all, mom will be around, dad will be around. They'll protect me from pain. And they thought because pain's always a bad thing. Secondly, what they may have done, they may, they may rebel against you because they're tired of your control. And they're tired of your protection. And they want to, why can't you just let me breathe? Why can't you just let me live? I can't wait to get out of here. I don't care if it's the military, it's college, it's the traveling circus. I don't care what it is. As soon as I can, I'm out. Bye. Because you never let me be me. You never let me experience life. And what they did, they looked at us and they found, you know what? People get old fast. Young folks aren't dumb. People get old fast. They also looked at them and they said, you know what? Old people don't have much fun. I'm going to have fun while I can because when I get old, I won't because no old person does. That's what they think. So let me get out there and let me do it now. And so I got to experience this stuff. And we overcompensate. 
oftentimes with our kids for, for different reasons, but normally because of a pain thing. But here, uh, Israel, he, he intentionally recreates part of his childhood past, the, the environment he grew up in, and so it's happening all over again. And so now Joseph is his favorite, and he doesn't even deny it. As parents, you have more than one kid. You love them both, don't you? Just, you do, you do. Do you love them the same way? You shouldn't because they're not the same person. Well, I love, I love Johnny the same way I love Susie. No, you don't. You shouldn't. They're, they're different. You love people differently because they are different. We tried them all, treated them all the same way. No, no, you didn't because they're, they're, they're different. And so you love them, you treat them different because they're different. But here, Israel, he loves Joseph so much, and he's not ashamed to let his other sons know, yep, he's the favored child. You know, he's, he's the golden one. And he gives them this, and this is the, we don't exactly know what it looks like, but something like this to wear. Now, for us, that going, who's going to wear that? Maybe it's some play or Halloween time, but, wow, that, it's a lot, a, lot of, a lot of colors to it, but that's not doing it for me. But what this meant is when he wore this around, um, Israel didn't even have to say anything. It was his way of, can't you see who's special here? It means I don't have to really engage in hard work. It means I've given a position of, of, of a priority. It means that I'm better than you. It means that my dad loves me more than he loves you. Not a word has to be spoken. He, they can just see that he's the favorite kid. You add this to what's already happened, and you go, this is not going to turn out very good. And so, and so, next verse, his brother saw. wasn't just this multicolored thing, but he saw how he was treated, that, that their father loved him, that is, Joseph, more than all his brother's so, and you saw this coming, they hated him. Who can blame him? I mean, they shouldn't, but who can really blame him? And they couldn't even speak very nice to him. Basically, they're just mean to him. Your dad's favorite, and you know what? We can't stand you. And Joseph, being 17, didn't have a lot of wisdom, and so he had this dream and he told his brothers what this dream meant. He said, this dream means that you are going to bow down and serve me all of your life. You add that to this, and they're just, they're just boiling inside. What? You have the gall to tell me that you have this dream, and you're going to interpret the dream? And your interpretation is all us older brothers are going to bow down, we're going to serve you. Oh, really? Ugh. So, they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. They hated him, but now they hate him even more. And you know something's going to happen. One day, Dad sends Joseph out to check on them. They're out in the field. They're looking after sheep. I don't know where they're at. Go check on them, would you? So he does that. That's his job. And when they saw him from a distance... Before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They had this conversation. How are we going to take him out? Should we take him out? Oh, absolutely. How are you going to, I don't know. Let's, let's come up with something because we can't take this anymore. Life would be better if little brother ceased to exist. Now, personally speaking, I grew up with an older brother, an older sister, and a younger brother. And uh, so much of our growing up, we, we called each other names and we hit, hit each other in the arm. That was a like it. And it just drove mom and dad crazy. And if you have kids today, you know one of the things that really gets to you is when your kids don't get along. And they're fussing and fighting and feuding and they're calling each other names and they're hitting each other in their arm, or even worse, and they're stealing their stuff. 
And, and my brother used to come up and I used to make, make these little, the little models, these little model kits, and you'd paint them, put them together, and glue them together. And to get back at me, they would come up and break my models. So what I would do, I'd go in the room, I'd break their models. You know, just, just dumb, dumb, dumb stuff. But that's what kids did. But, but never, ever did I really think life would be better if they no longer existed. I thought life would be better if they moved out of the house, but not if they no longer existed. They probably thought about the same thing about me. Life would be better if Rick just got a job somewhere else. He went and lived with a relative or a stranger. Who cares? But if he got out of the house, life would be better. But I don't think they ever wanted me dead. I don't think they ever plotted to put me to death. But that's what came up here. So, it came about when Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped Joseph of his tunic because they hated the tunic. They took him and threw him into the pit. And the pit was empty without any water, so he would die soon without any water in that pit. Just throw him in. Well, that's what we're going to do. That's, that's, a, that's a good plan. Now, we're going to make up some story to tell Dad, but he's out of our lives. Life is better. Um, no more stupid tunic. No more favoritism to a dumb son. And, and they did this, and look what they did next. Then they sat out and eat a meal. That's just bizarre to me. They're throwing, they're throwing Joseph in a pit, and I'm guessing they're near the pit. Now, if you're thrown in a pit, probably what are you doing? I'm going to be screaming. I'm going to be yelling. I'm going to be pleading. I'm going to be doing anything, making promises that I can't keep. Get me out of this pit. And so they probably hear Joseph yelling. And you know what? We sure worked up an appetite throwing our brother in the pit. Uh, Let's have something to eat. So they're sitting around picnicking while Joseph's in the pit. Okay. Um, The older brother came, or one of the older brothers said, said, what? Prophet is us to kill our brother and cover up his blood. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. Oh, yeah, let's sell him into slavery. Let us not kill him because then the, his blood would be on our hands. You see, even people who plot to murder have some sort of a code and a conscience, don't they? Let us not kill him. Here, you guys do whatever you want. You take him to where you You kill him. We don't care. But then his blood's not on our hands. It's ridiculous, but it's true. So they did. They sold him into slavery. They they made some profit. And they they tell his his father that something happened. They, They took this tunic and they dipped it into blood of an animal they slaughtered. And then they took it back to their father and said, Dad, guess what? We don't know what happened to Joe. All we know is we found this tunic. And his his father concludes, oh my, a a wild animal must have killed him because look what happened. They tore him to shreds. And and so Dad is grieving. They cannot console him. And this is what it says about Dad. Dad says, surely I will go down to Sheol, that is the grave, in mourning for my son. Maybe I will never get out over my son dying. I will die in grief. That's what they say. And their brothers are like this. Meanwhile, meanwhile, back at the ranch, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. End of Genesis chapter 36. And you're going, that is a lot of stuff. Really, that's just background. That's foundation for the next several weeks. But go, you know what? If you didn't know how this story went, how do you think it would go? Let's see. Young 17-year-old Sold, to, sold into slavery, going to a foreign country. Do you know what they do with people like that? Whatever they want. Now, this isn't, this isn't going to go very well. I mean, and I want to say, can you think of a, of a more dysfunctional family than the one Joseph is a part of? His dad plays favorites. His brothers can't stand him. Going to kill him, sell him off, make a profit. Mom's not around. And you go, oh my. 
and you thought your family was a mess, huh? That's nothing compared to this. And I can say, if you didn't know any better, you would have thought that this is just not going to go very well. A couple things. Number one, sometimes we feel like Joseph. We do. This is not fair. I am 17. Okay, maybe I didn't use the best sense of telling my brothers this dream. They were going to serve me. But other than that, I was doing my job. I didn't ask to be dad's favorite. I didn't ask for this tunic. Uh, I've done some things wrong, but it doesn't deserve this. Sometimes we feel like we're stuck in a rut or we're in a pit or we've been sold into some kind of a slavery where we can't get out of this situation and we don't know where to turn. It's beyond our control. And life doesn't look very good. The future does not look very, very favorable to us. Where there is no hope. And at times like this, there's easy to ask, God, where are you? He had to be asking this. Okay, I'm thrown in a pit. Went in a pit very long, but now... I don't know, maybe it would have been better to die in a pit than sold into slavery where my life is not my own. So, so, God, what's going on? Can you help me figure this out? This doesn't seem to be right for someone who, who trusts in you. I don't get it. This is, this is not just. We ask that question sometimes. It's a legitimate question. Most of the time, though, what you hear in answer to that question is this. Which tends to make it worse. I'm crying out. I hear nothing but silence. Why is someone ill? Why did someone die? Why is my life a mess? Why can I see any, not see any hope for the future? God, if you're real, why don't you do something? Second thing is, it isn't over until it's over. We're not done here. It's the end of a chapter, but it's not the end of a life. You're not done yet. You've come to a place, but your story is still being told. The book is still being written. It was by the old theologian. Uh, Do you have any more? All right. But it was Yogi Berra who said, it ain't over till it's over. That's right. I guess maybe this is over. Uh, mm. Your family, however dysfunctional, does not define you. Your family influences, but it does not define who you are. Maybe you were not born into the best one. Your family does not define you. You do not have to live up to their expectations. Some of you cannot, and you've been trying. No matter whatever you do, you, they will always let you know that you have not arrived yet. There's always more to do. There are some folks you will never satisfy, and they use that as a tool against you to get you to try to accomplish things. Don't, you, don't let us be ashamed. Don't bring shame to the family. So go out and accomplish. Go and do. Here again, some will never be satisfied. You don't have to live up to their expectations. And to them, you don't have to prove anything. Once you no longer have someone to impress or something to prove, I go, you're free to now live. 
everyone gets stuck in life. No one has this red carpet through life. The life is a series of open doors. Sometimes the carpet is yanked out from under you and the door slams shut. Everyone has a pit. Everyone has things outside of their control. And in some way they feel like they're enslaved to something. It's not the fact that you're in a pit or you've been sold. It's what you do when you're in the pit. Because we all have pits. We all get stuck. And I want to say, in every rut, there is hope. People with character and integrity have hope when they're in the pit. Because if you don't, you'll do anything to get out. You'll make any deal. You'll cut any corner. Short-term fixes normally fix nothing. But they will ruin a life. In every rut there is hope. I'm going to tell you this. In every rut there is God. You say, I know that. I just don't see him. That's right. Sometimes we don't. Well, when is he going to show up? Maybe he has shown up. We just don't recognize his presence or matter what he may be up to. Don't give up because you don't think he has shown up. He has shown up. Third thing is God is always up to something. Just know, God is always up to something. Sometimes I'm like, well, how come I had to live up here for a year and a half on my own? It hasn't been easy. It hasn't been terrible, but it hasn't been easy. I wonder, I wonder if, if maybe it is an issue of further character development in myself. Because normally, uh, someone's character is shown uh, by, by what they do when they're alone. Right? Is, is my character different whether my wife is here or not? I mean, I could have stayed out. I could have stayed out really late at night. And the only one who would have known would have been a crippled cat. <laughs> that walks on a walks on a stub. And she wouldn't have cared. She's just glad when I get home. She would never have said, Where have you been? And what is that? Oh, I smell. No, she would have done that. I was glad you're home and have something to eat. I could sit out late at night and I could have went all kinds of places. Who would have known? I would have kept a light on and cut the garage door down. No, no one would have known. But I'm so glad today that I can say, I didn't do it. Where am I going to go? And what am I going to do? So basically, it is me and the cat. <laughs> God is always up to something. And we don't normally know what it is. We often think we do, but we don't. Ah, I see. Oh, I know. Sometimes, but often, we haven't a clue. We just know God's up to something. You ever ask yourself, what's God up to my, with my kids? We ask that a lot, don't we? What has God up to with my kids? Or my grandkids? What, what is this? What's going on? I can't figure it out. That's right. I wish God would tell me. Sure you do. I do too. I don't know. One's with us. One's back in Pittsburgh. I, we, we hope. We plan. Uh, we, uh, but I don't know. What are they going to do? Well, I think they're thinking of doing this. But if you really ask me tomorrow, it could be different. I'm not sure. You hope for the best and you pray for them. And... But what we do know, while God is up to something, he often takes us through difficulty. Doesn't he? When God takes you through hard times, don't think that is abnormal or that means the absence of God. Often it means it's the presence of God. 
And to see God in the midst of difficulty is so important or we won't see God most of the time because most of our lives, to some degree, has difficulty, doesn't it? Well, my wife's moving, closing on a house. My younger brother is out in Iowa. In the, ba- in the last two weeks, both of my parents are now in a nursing home. When he told me my mom was, I just started to weep. You see this stuff coming. But when it hits, you're just not ready for that stuff. And in the last week, uh, he also put dad in there. Aren't you guys better together? And and they've been married probably 60-some-odd years. I can't remember. And, and they're together. Um, life's like that, isn't it? God takes us through difficulty because oftentimes that's, that's the laboratory for his integrity and his character building. People who have had an easy life often don't have much character. When you run into hard times, do you want to talk to someone who's been given everything, has gone through nothing? That's the last person I want to be around. I want to know someone who's gone through even worse than me. So they can sit there and say, Rick, you can make it. It's going to be okay. I've been there, buddy. It's been worse than that. And look at me. I've got it together. I'm still, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. I was in the pit. I didn't know if I was going to get out of the pit. Then I was in slavery. I didn't know what was going to happen, but look where I'm at now. It's like, that's what I need to do. Thank you so much. God's always up to something. And sometimes, sometimes it's more for his glory than it is our good. But it's also both times, uh, oftentimes both our glory and his good going on. God will do anything for his glory because his glory is more important than our happiness. Did you know that? <laughs> Did you know that? His glory is more important than our happiness or our lack of confusion. His glory is more important than that than I feel fulfilled or that I have all the answers. I have a few. And he'll do about anything to get his glory. He easily uses dysfunctional families for his glory. The fourth point is, it's not over until God says it's over. Not until then. I go, as long as you have a pulse, you have a purpose. And don't let, don't let a pit, a rut, Enslavement of any kind. Take that thought from your mind. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose, and it isn't over until God says it's over, and your book has not been finished yet. We just started with the life of Joseph. In some ways, we've just begun with your your life and my life. There's so much more to be written. There is so much more. Not all pain is bad pain. Some of it is used, if nothing else, it's for character and integrity building. And when we became more like when we become more like Christ in the middle of hard times, I believe God gets the glory. Would you pray with me? God, yeah, it's tough, but you're still good. It's tough, but it's still okay. It ain't over yet, and you're not through with us yet. Because our life isn't over yet. So may we learn from the life of Joseph. And may his life of character and integrity 
in the midst of hard times also be our story. So work through us, speak to us. May we glorify you with our very being. And we pray this in Christ's name.